the traffic and the drizzling rain and, and all of that. Uh, again, Bob, thanks for having me here today. It's always a, a great opportunity to talk about State Defense Forces for a primary reason that so many folks, many of whom have been involved in the military their whole life, are just not aware State Defense Forces exist. It's probably one of the best kept secrets in, uh, in America on, on defense that we have that possibility. And that's been one of the things that have held back State Defense Forces for years from being what they should be and what they could be and what they were for this country during World War I and World War II. Uh, it's interesting, this week, uh, Wednesday, I testified before the Kansas State Legislature Slature Joint Committee on uh, Security, where Kansas is looking into establishing a State Defense Force for the first time since World War II. And in going to testify for that, uh, there were, uh, myself was there, the State Guard Association was there, a number of folks from around the country uh, for State Defense Forces were there testifying, and also was the Kansas Adjutant General and their position was that they did not support state defense forces. They did not oppose state defense forces, but they did not support it. And in their testimony, we, had, we heard the same arguments I've been hearing on this issue since 2001 uh, when I joined the state defense force. And a lot of it is just not having knowledge on what they are, what they're capable of doing, and how they can function within a state. Uh, to supplement both the National Guard and also all other public safety and health organizations within the state. Uh, it seems the main objection when you get to uh, those within the National Guard family that are not supported, uh, which is a minority I might add, uh, it's that to admit that, to, that a, a state defense force would be a good idea in some way is acknowledging that the National Guard is not capable of fulfilling their mission, which that's totally ridiculous. No one uh, doubts whether the National Guard can fulfill their Homeland Security mission. And state defense forces are not there to try to take that over. What they are there to do is that in the total absence of the National Guard, as we had during World War II, that we have an adequately trained, armed, disciplined force in place to guarantee that the states are never left without state military reserves to handle natural disasters, man-made disasters, and Homeland Security needs. Uh, in the interim, while they're in training, they're there as a supplement to the National Guard and to support the National Guard, not in any way to compete with it. In any state in which you ever allow the State Defense Force to enter any type of competition against the National Guard, you just guarantee that it's not going to work in that state. It cannot compete against the Guard. It's there to support the Guard in the same way that the Civil Air Patrol supports the Air Force Auxiliary and the Coast Guard Auxiliary supports the Coast Guard. Uh, as a complementary supportive organization that brings additional resources, personnel, and talent to the table. Uh, the reason we support state defense forces, a lot of people look at our organization and go, you know, your charter mission is middle class economic interest, so why would you be involved in this? Well, Homeland Security is one area that if we don't have it, it doesn't matter what our other economic interests in this country are, we're not, we're not going to survive. It must be there for us to have any chance for any group of people in this country to continue to survive economically. And in state defense forces, you have the most cost-effective force multiplier available to the military today in terms of dollars expended. And when we had the testimony Wednesday, the JAG officer from the Adjutant General's office that was testifying, they had put an estimate on the cost of establishing a 750-man State Defense Force for Kansas at a three and a half million dollar startup cost. Uh, and as part of that, they had detailed what the startup cost would be, which I see the smile on the Major's face from New York that, God almighty, if we had that kind of money ever, you know, what a happy day that would be in any state. That fund all the Defense Forces in the country for two years at this stage. But what they had included in that three and a half million dollars was the cost for 750 troops to bring them on board, to train them, to arm them with M16s and 9 millimeters, to assign 40 National Guard instructors uh, to instruct them and bring them up to speed, to feed them to the tune of $586,000 a year to feed them, which I'd love to see that in Virginia. You know, we feed up feeding us is it's now lunchtime, go out and buy something. Uh, and what it made clear was the cost advantage of state defense forces. For Virginia, for years in the past, our total budget for the year for our 800-man force is about $50,000. This year, we're up to 250000 
because we've done such a big job in supporting other agencies in the state that the state came back without our requesting and it said we want to give we, we love what you've done with 50 we want you to do more and so for the first time we're up to 250,000 this year but most state defense forces are around fifty thousand dollars many existed for several years with zero budget just simply member support you have a lot of former military folks that are glad to turn out and serve if they can serve one weekend a month and are not subject to uh, deployment overseas or deployment for a long period of time they're happy to turn out and serve and if they're called to state active duty then they're generally paid the same DOD pay grade as regular National Guard with some exceptions uh, which we'll talk about as we we move forward a little bit but it was fascinating that to put 750 National Guardsmen in the field would be three and a half million dollars to put 750 state defense force people would be 50,000 so you immediately see the cost advantage of having this as a deep military reserve. The purpose of state defense forces, going back in history a little bit, uh, began shortly after the Dick Act in 1903, which created today's modern National Guard, in which the Department of Defense and the nation and Congress looked at some of the problems the nation had during the Spanish-American War with units showing up in the field with different arms, different training, different commands, different uniforms, and how do we interpret that and some of the units being very very good and well trained and others not and so we had the Dick Act to nationalize the National Guard with some federal standards and federal funding and that worked very well up to World War One until uh, World War One in 1916 when we deployed 100,000 National Guard to the southern border in order to restore order there which is interesting you know history repeats itself and here we are in 2007 with a, another National Guard deployment to the southern border uh, but as World War I kicked in and many of the states were depleted of their National Guard for overseas service, the governor said, we're left with no national, we're left with no military reserves. If we have a tornado or hurricane or riot, we're in a mess. So they started creating a state defense force of troops reserved strictly for in-state duty. Uh, that rapidly died down after World War I when the need was no longer there. But interestingly, in 1940, Congress and the Roosevelt administration before World War II broke out in anticipation that we would have a tremendously increased strain on our military, uh, passed a new piece of legislation creating state guards during for World War II. World War II, we had 100% National Guard deployment to overseas uh, theaters, and we had a state defense forces nationwide of about 175,000 troops, which handled all of the homeland security missions within the continental United States. And actually, the Hawaii State Defense Force uh, worked under the active army in, in uh, manning coastal defenses there. It was a very effective group. It, it kept our homeland secure while our National Guard was overseas, again, with 100% deployment. After World War II, again, the State Defense Forces died back down. We came back into existence roughly around 1985, during the heart of the Cold War, uh, with many states uh, uh, bringing their state defense forces back. We're now up to 24 state defense forces nationwide, uh, and that's an increase of two over the last several years. Arizona earlier this year just reactivated their state defense force. As I mentioned, Kansas is looking into a state defense force, which would be an additional uh, unit there. Uh, nationwide total right now, we're around 20,000 troops, which is amazing when you consider that during World War II, with half the population that we currently have, we fielded 175,000 troops, and today we're fielding 20,000. And what a tremendous benefit that would be uh, in our ongoing effort in this war on terror, which we, I think we all recognize it's gonna go on for a long, long time. Maybe not in the theaters that we're in today, but it is a long-term generational challenge to America in how we meet this, both at, at home and overseas. Uh, as we get into homeland security issues now we have our various defense forces around the country because of the lack of attention lack of resources and lack of federal encouragement uh, they're all over the place uh, some of you have, have maybe heard some comments on state defense forces before and heard what a tremendous job they do in backing up their National Guard a tremendous job they do with homeland security within their state other of you have heard comments about well they're a bunch of uh, uh, military wannabes and uh, overranked and out of shape and not capable of doing any any real military service and I want to tell you that both of those statements are true everything you've ever heard about state defense forces good and bad is true around the country because of lack of federal <coughs> support lack of federal direction 
The National Guard Bureau has generally had a hands-off approach on state defense forces because Congress, under current law, uh, in which state defense forces are authorized under 